is hypothesis testing. Um, if you have downloaded an older copy of the syllabus, you'll know that that's not today's original topic. But through the miracle of reprogramming the syllabus, I made it today's topic. Uh, the original topic was data models, and that'll get uh, probably pushed on to next week sometime. So what is hypothesis testing? Um, if, if you can read, it says up there, a procedure to systematically decide if two data collections are the same or different. That's literally all a hypothesis test is. So there are fewer people in the classroom today than I thought there'd be. And I'll be taking roll silently because I think I know almost everybody's names. I, actually, I don't. But I'm going to guess, let's suppose I was able to ask two of you an embarrassing question. And who's willing to answer one? It's not too embarrassing. OK, what's your weight? Uh, 205 pounds. OK. Catherine, what's your weight? 175. Okay, so we've we've got nine people in the classroom, ten including me. So we, we'll we'll include me for today, so I can do the arithmetic. Now I want to go ahead and speculate what the most likely weight is of anybody in the classroom. What would be the first metric that would come to your mind to do that? mean, an arithmetic mean. Um, and we actually have a couple more pieces of information. I wouldn't have guessed 205 for you. You're not small, but you're also not refrigerator, Perry, football player size. So you know, we figure an upper limit would be 600 pounds. Nobody in this room is at all likely to weigh more than 600. And the only people that weigh zero are the invisible members of the class, all 41 of them. So the average of 205 and 175 is, see so that 12 to 75, that's 185, 86 to 187, and another two and a half, I think it's 189. Doing that in my head. So if I were to guess 189 in and of itself, that would probably be wrong for everybody. Anyone here within a pound of 189 right now? Yeah, none of us. Um, what's the next thing I could do using this very small collection of information? Let's say I want to, rather than guess the weight of anyone in this room, I'm going to guess a range that's most likely to contain everybody's weight. I don't want that range to be too big. I mean, 0 to 600, done, guaranteed. I'll always win. But we can look at the difference between these two. That's 30. And I can go 189 plus 30 is 229. And minus 30 is 159. So I speculate that, oh, she comes in and screws up these statistics. Hi, welcome. <laughs> um, <laughs> Until Jasmine walked in, <clears throat> who I guess is, does not have a weight between 159 and 229 pounds. Yes or no? Are you in that range? Body weight? I know that's a complete surprise. Uh, okay. <laughs> Stunned look on your face. Good, good response. Me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, I am. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I looked out. Um, the rest of you. Who is, who is bigger than 229 pounds in this room? Heavier. No one. Either that or you're very shy. Less than 159. One. So all we did is specify a range, which is kind of like a standard deviation, kind of like a variance. And we went one below and one above. Put that off of our mean value, and we have a pretty good estimate of weights in the room. Mark. 49 plus 30 is 219. Yeah, well, don't do that new math shit on me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Are you more than 219? No. Okay. <laughs> How about 189 minus 30? I get the 159 right? You got that one right. Okay. Good. I'll be able to work in Washington, D.C. at taking money away. Uh, <laughs> okay, so if we were to go to the room next door and play that same game, there's more people in it. Um, most of us probably are in that range anyway. But let's say we played that game and in the room next door, we got a mean of 163, and they had a twig person there. And so let's say that's what we came up with the room next door. I don't, I'm not saying that is the values. A question arises, these are both samples of students at Texas Tech. Are the samples sampling the same thing or not? In other words, is the behavior of that group of people somehow different than this group? Uh, there's a couple ways we could answer that. We can look at that and go, well, all the numbers are different, so yeah, of course they're different. But are they different enough to bet your life on? Uh, we could plot them in histograms. We'll do that in a second. Not with these numbers, with different numbers. And look at the histograms and see if they look like they're on top of each other or far apart. Um, but neither of those two are very quantitative in the sense that uh, you can't make a television commercial while you're trying to sell a medication to make you all better. Uh, the last tool we use is something called a hypothesis test. And all that is is we're going to look at those differences and the sample data itself and make a probability statement of what is the probability that these two different collections came from the same parent collection or not, and what is the approximate probability of overlap or not. If the two sample collections are far enough apart, there's no overlap, and so we would safely conclude under most conditions that they're different. But that's not very interesting. The interesting is, is when there is some overlap, whether that overlap can be explained simply to random variation or if there's actual differences. So that's, that's the goal of hypothesis testing. Now in your statistics class, when you take it, uh, either taught by mathematicians or the industrial engineering department, or whatever it calls themselves now, um, they'll put a lot of effort into making this incomprehensible. I'm doing my best to keep it sort of comprehensible, but I'm quite capable of making it incomprehensible too, so bear with us. All right, so our goals here are to apply some fundamental concepts in probability and descriptive statistics, and then look at the components of what's called a hypothesis. Hypothesis is just a question. Is our room's mean behavior different than that room's mean behavior. That's the hypothesis. And then we look at some different probability models. The most common one for the hypothesis test is normal. And then we look at if everyone has one or two tails. Um, and then this concept of significance, which is the probability of overlap. And then finally, there's a couple of decision errors we can make. Uh, in terms of computational thinking concepts, this is largely an abstraction pattern recognition component. And just reading my notes to you, when we wish to start asking questions about the data and interpret the results, we often use statistical methods that give us a confidence or likelihood about the answers. And not confidence in the literary sense, but a probability of being right. That's all a confidence interval is. Um, or uh, hypothesis testing or significance tests. So the material for today's lecture is inspired by these uh, sleep-inducing URLs. So if you're having difficulty sleeping, preferably after the uh, lesson, uh, go ahead and visit those. They should have you out like a light. Confidence is high. So what is hypothesis testing? It's a method that's used in making decisions using experimental data. So the sample that we just took of the classroom, the two people, 
um, is, is a sample. It's a sample of this classroom. What we did is we took those two body weights and we stipulated that they are representative of the population of the 11 of us now. Um, we have the luxury, if we wanted to, because all 11 of us are here, if we declared ourselves the population, we could, I could ask each your body weights and we could get a very accurate measure of the mean and a very accurate measure of how variable those weights are. That works for body weights in a room of 11 people, but it doesn't work too good for body weights, say, in a nation of 320 million, especially given that um, many people will lie about their body weight when, when we're uh, collecting data. And you should lie to the government. But <laughs> um, And the hypothesis test itself is, is essentially an assumption that we're going to make about the population based on the sample. So my assumption on body weights in this room, I assume that I will never observe anybody in this room 225 pounds or greater. I have no way of testing that conjecture unless I weigh each and every one of you. But my sample suggests that that's probably a pretty good assumption, at least based on the 12 of us. Um, because 225 is, is quite outside one of our range, our mean plus one of our range values. And we also want a mathematical way to support whatever we're stating is true. And we validate these hypotheses um, based on random samples and empirical distribution. So why do we use it? It's an essential procedure in experimentation. It's absolutely vital in making television commercials to sell people crap they don't need. Uh, we evaluate two mutually exclusive statements about a population to determine which statement is supported by the sample data. And when we state that a finding is statistically significant, it's a statement relative to the hypothesis test itself. So if you can think of the advertising thing, Moderna is awesome compared to sniffing bath salts for curing viruses. Our, that's our hypothesis test. How can we prove that? Get 10,000 people that got Moderna and see if they're still dead or not, um, and 10,000 people that have been uh, sniffing personal care products <laughs> to see if they're dead or not. If in those two groups of 10,000, those samples, uh, the amount of undead is about the same. I'm, I'm trying to work a walking dead uh, joke into this, so you have to bear with me. The problem with stand-up comedy as you develop it in the classroom is it's still got to do the classroom stuff. Uh, if they're about the same, we don't perceive any difference in those two treatments, and so our hypothesis test, whatever it is, would not support the statement that Moderna's awesome, personal care products, uh, as a viral prevention part. We don't have evidence of that. Is yes? That, is that what a null hypothesis is? We'll, we'll get to that, but uh, the null hypothesis is you make the conjecture, and it's what happens if there's not a difference. And then the alternative is, is the difference. Uh, we'll see those terms shortly. <laughs> really shortly. Yeah, we, we, we did this ahead of time, so it looked like I'm a genius. Um, what are the important elements? Uh, the first is something called the null hypothesis. The second is called the alternative. The null hypothesis is a general statement or, or a default position that there is no relationship between the two measured phenomena. So the null hypothesis, Moderna, Personal care products, no relationship between them and undeadness. Um, the alternative hypothesis is uh, the hypothesis that is contrary to the null hypothesis. So Moderna, personal care products, more undead with Moderna. 
would be the alternative hypothesis. And then the basis of the actual test is we will consider those differences or possibly the values themselves to be distributed according to some probability distribution model. We studied those back in lesson 14 briefly. Didn't spend much time on it, but a probability um, density model, if you will, is just some function about collections of things. So the things might be balls with numbers on them, like it's going to go tomorrow night and win $40 million. Um, and the balls themselves are unique, but they may have, there may be three balls with threes on it, and four balls with twos, and so on. And if the collection we're interested in is the numbers that come out of the ball spitting machine, that is, there is some probability distribution that explains those uh, numbers. And one of the distributions in common use is the normal distribution. And I wish I had some smart aleck name for how it came about. I guess because it's not Abby normal. Uh, but there are a lot of other ones. Uh, there's just, for instance, there's gamma, there's beta. And I'm talking probability distributions, not COVID-19 variants. There are delta distributions. Um, <laughs> probably alpha distribution, but I don't recall them. They're all similar in two senses. They integrate to a value of 1 on the range minus infinity to infinity. Um, that's one of their uh, properties that they all have. And uh, the other one is when you do that integrated probability, the values that return are between 0 and 1. But their shapes are vastly different. So in the picture here are three normal distributions. The blue one, the red one, and the green one. The fundamental difference between the blue one and the red one is not the measure of central tendency. Those are both zero. That's indicated by this first parameter that goes by the name of mu. Um, they're indicated by their variance, the sigma squared, which is how spread apart the numbers are. So the blue one and the red one are the same distribution, but the red one has values over a greater horizontal expanse. The orange one, greater still, also still centered at zero. The green one, the mu is set to minus two, and so the pointy part is um, at minus 2. That's the measure of central tendency. That's its average, if you will. And the variability is set to a half, and so on. So if we were to change, just keep your eye on the green one. Keep your eye on the front. If we were to change the value of mu on the green one from minus 2, which is what it is in that picture, to 0, where would you expect the green one to plot if you replotted it? Yeah, shifted to the right a distance of two units on the x-axis. When we look at um, any one of those distributions and normalize them, so by normalizing them, we declare that we will subtract off the mean value, so the mean is zero, and we will, um, where's the normalization formula, and we will uh, normalized by the standard deviation, then we can um, examine the behavior of any normal distribution with, with a picture like this, although we don't normally use the picture. So at a value of zero in a normal standard, in a standardized normal distribution, that represents the mean value, that's the value of mu. And if you're to look at that, you'll see it's shaded in different uh, um, intensities of blue. If we go from the left to zero, so the leftmost value there is not even on the plot is minus infinity. And if we integrated, calculated the area under that curve from minus infinity all the way up to zero, it would come out to be a half, 0 0.5. If we integrated from 
minus 1 to 0, it would be, I can't do that, 34.15. So most of the area from minus infinity to 0 under that curve is located pretty close to, to the mean value to 0. If we went two standard deviations, we would get half, whatever half of 95 is. If we go three, we get half of 99. Alternatively, if we integrated from minus infinity all the way to infinity, the area under that curve would be one. If we were to integrate from minus three standard deviations, to plus three standard deviations, the area under that curve is, say it's up there in the picture, 99 point something. So the relations of standard deviations and integrals of the curve are what we uh, commonly know as our cumulative density function. So a normal distribution, a variable is normally distributed if it kind of follows that distribution. Um, a standard normal distribution is a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation. Let's play some games with, uh, with script. So back in lesson 13, we had these two functions, one called norm density, the other one called norm dist, and we built them ourselves. Um, the only thing, uh, norm density is not very interesting. The norm distribution had this funny um, function called the error function, which, which essentially is the integral of the normal, dis normal density function. So we can recreate those. They're done. They're loaded. And now let's, let's draw some pictures. And down here, before I actually run the script, we see this a bit of highlighted code. What do you think is going on there? Nothing to do with, with probabilities, this is just Python. It's what? Yeah, it's importing, what's the name of the file? <laughs> you need to sit closer, Catherine. It's bigger up on this end, I'm sure. Um, the file name is make2plot.py. So what is make2plot.py? We have no idea because I'm in the wrong directory, but we can find that out real quickly. So there is my file. And back in lesson 13, we, we built this uh, function. And out of laziness, which is a good thing in this class, I have flies buzzing on me. I bathed yesterday. Uh, I want to reuse it, so I just save it to a file. I can import files as if they were external modules anywhere I can, as long as the file is located in the same directory that the notebook's running. And other than that, I've made no changes. So it's going to plot some things in red and some things in blue. It's going to use the word observations and model. But the advantage is instead of all that glob of code appearing in the notebook, we just import it and then use it as needed. So we're going to start with mu is 0 and sigma equals the square root of 0 0.5. So we're going to, we're basically going to plot the green curve because it's got the same parameters with the exception that instead of centering at minus 2, it'll center at 0. And so now we're going to make some observations. And this is a pretty cool. NumPy, um, you land, you're going to die. <sighs> what do you do? Watched him beat himself. Uh, NumPy.random.randn, uh, open parentheses, some integer, close parentheses, is a function built into NumPy that will take a 
sample from a standard normal distribution and, and return it. So you can think of it as that standard normal distribution. It goes out and picks a number and puts it in the bucket. That's if you do it uh, with an argument of one. If you do an argument of 100, it does it 100 times. And it's sampling with replacement. So it's quite possible to get 17 threes. I think your sample size would have to be pretty big for that to happen. Um, and then this part of it is shifting the numerical values that it's pulling by sigma and mu so that we can replicate a parameterized normal distribution. So all that, all that thing is doing is pulling numbers out of a bucket, pulling numbers out of a distribution, putting them into a bucket. So if I had the ability, the ability to put infinity here and have it actually work, what would end up in that bucket? This is the key concept. I'll tell you after you suffer for a few seconds. It would be infinity. You're very close. What would be in the bucket? Numbers. 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 How many numbers? Infinity. An infinite number of numbers. What? Values would those numbers take in the bucket? Every number from minus infinity to infinity. So that's that's the key thing. We're not going to sample an infinite number of times because I don't have enough lifetime left to wait on it to get done. We'll just take a hundred numbers out of the bucket. And in our case, we expect those hundred numbers to center around zero and have whatever variation determined by this value sigma. Then I'm going to sort them, and the only point of sorting them is for the plotting. And then I'm going to create a list called a PDF, so named because I have no creativity. And for every number in the observation, the sample if you will, I'm going to compute the norm density associated with that number. Um, then we're going to take a different range just from minus 3 sigma to plus 3 sigma and we will compute the same values. That's going to be our model. Hence we're going to give it the name model domain and model range. And then we'll go ahead and plot everything and see what there is to see. So we do that and there's our plot. So the red upside down triangles those came from our sampling from this uh, NumPy um, random sampling tool. The blue curve is the model we just created. And it's not surprising that they overlay each other. They're supposed to in this case. Um, but look at the uh, shape of either of those as compared to the green picture up here. Do they look kind of the same? Yeah, except they're red and blue and not green. And this is centered at zero instead of minus two. So how do we fix that if we want to? Simply change. Now it's centered at minus two. And I would stipulate that these two are now identical. If we had the ability to plot them on the same graph, we would see them as identical. If I really cared, I could go change the... Uh, the value in a make two plot from blue to green. How are we for time? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. We're making pretty good time. If that really uh, bothered me, I could do this because I actually have a bad scripting syntax. I'm loading it in every time, so it should pick up that only pick up that change if I actually save it, won't it? Oh, it, I don't want to reset it. It didn't pick up the change because once it's loaded it in once, I guess it doesn't do it again. Or did I screw up? Yeah, I made that a green. I saved it. I'll have to work on that. So moving along, so we have this 
we have this toy right here that we can plot distributions and uh, if we don't trust 100 we can do hopefully won't regret 10,000 samples and now our model is a really faithful representation of what we see plotted. So moving along uh, there's something called the z-score and this is working that example backwards in that we have our observations we want to convert them from whatever they are into a standard normal uh, relationship. The reason we do that is stuff with mean zero standard deviation one is a lot easier to work with because a lot of people way smarter than us have already coded it. And then we can uh, use the miracle of CCMR, which means lesson two, CCMR. It's not a band from the 70s, although that would have been a cool thing too. Cite, copy, modify. Good enough. I use run, but reuse is good enough. And that's, that's why you're supposed to uh, cite your sources. So the z-score is just a way of standardizing a score so it can be referred to a, a, a single function instead of having to do uh, all of this silly business up here. Yeah. 20 years ago, all that silly business was a pain in the neck. Maybe there's not so much need for it anymore, but it's, it's going to stick with us, so you need to at least know what the z-score is. Again, if you're not asleep yet and you want to, uh, you can learn more about z-scores at these URLs. Now, when we talk about our null and alternative hypothesis, there's a couple things that can happen. We can have the case when we're looking at two different collections where we care if one collection is, is just bigger than the other one. That would be what would commonly known as a one-tailed test. So we, we care on which side of that normal distribution the overlap does or does not occur. The alternative, a, another way of a similar problem is we care that the collections are different from one another, either bigger or smaller. We don't care about the bigger or smaller parts so much as we care about different or not different. In that case, that's a two-tailed test. And in the case of a two-tailed test or two-sided hypothesis, we want to look at the left picture. So we're worried about overlap on the right edge and on the left edge. And we want to go ahead and develop our overlap probabilities with that in mind. In a one-sided test, we're just concerned about overlap on one side. And the sidedness will maybe make more sense when we get to some um, pictures. So let's now look at a case where we're going to create two samples by simulation. So we're going to use our simulator, our random number generator, pull samples from normal distribution. The distributions are going to be identical except for the value of mu that we specify. One distribution, go ahead and flip the yarn out. Don't try to, just try to hold it back and be polite. Um, yeah, I don't mind today. <laughs> You're not going to sleep the rest of the day. I just screwed up here on morning now. I apologize. But it's funny for me, so that's cool. We're going to have these two samples. We're going, to, we're going to make one distribution have a much different mean value than the other. So we're going to simulate, we're, we're going to by simulation create two collections that are supposed to be different. Let's have fun and let's, let's make damn sure they're different. So one of them is going to have a mean value of minus 10. The other one will have a mean value of 0. Uh, they're both going to have uh, Why do you keep doing that? They're both going to have a standard deviation of, of um, whatever the square root of 0.5 is. We'll do a thousand samples from each. One of them is called sample one. The other one's called sample two. Then we'll go ahead and, and make the two plots. Now in this case, 
The red markers in the blue plot are just representing the two different collections. They're not representing observation and model, but I didn't want to change my script because I'm lazy. And then we're going to make a, uh, a histogram of the two. We're going to put the two histograms on top of each other, jack a little bit with the uh, intensity. So in the histogram call, that alpha equals 0.5 says, take whatever color you're going to make it and make it 50% transparent. So anything behind it will show through. Anything in front of it will, will not obscure it. And so th this is not the values yet. But you know, look at those two pictures. There's, there's some overlap. This overlap area is that alpha area that is shown up here. So let's go ahead and do our example. Okay, so in the distribution model, those look the same or different? 50-50 chance. Shape is the same, but are the distributions the same? Excellent. Yes. Yeah. They're the mean values are are clearly different. They're they're not near each other on the uh, number line. And if we produce histograms of the two, the blue histogram and the orange histogram, if you squint hard enough, they kind of look about the same. But they're quite a bit apart on the on the on the x-axis, so we would safely be able to conclude, yep, those two collections are different, and make our engineering decisions accordingly. But what if they're not that far apart? So now there's a little bit of overlap, and sure enough, in the histogram, there's a little bit of overlap. And then in the absence of any uh, systematic test, at this point it's you know, individual judgment. Elizabeth, are these the same or different? Your opinion. I'm going to ask you why, too. So. The shape is the same. Right? And is that, that's as far as you're going to go? Go ahead, stick your neck out. I'm not going to bite it off. In the overlap region, is there much evidence that something could happen there just by random accident? Yeah, there is. So and these are different. Now, now let's make it. So if you had the ability to compute the area of the overlap region, and you don't because we're actually not plotting it on the correct scales. The area of that region represents the probability of commonality. And in that, in that representation right there, that's kind of small. It's not super small, but it's small. So one's at zero. So let's put them closer together still. Now the overlap region is kind of substantial. We know because we're God, we're in God mode by tweaking those uh, values of the mean. The means are different. The population means are different because so we've simulated this. But the evidence based part, what we have in the sample, there's so much overlap, there's no way of telling if a number came from the blue or the orange category. And that's the essence of a hypothesis test. And now we're going to take that essence and then figure out a complicated arithmetic to make it hard to do and, and quantify that. So the level of significance is something that we choose as analysts on whether we accept. Remember, the null hypothesis is they're the same. The alternative hypothesis is, for lack of a better thing, they're different. So in this particular picture, if the null hypothesis is they're the same, is there enough evidence to reject that hypothesis? And the terminology is key. There's a whole lot of overlap. So no, there's not much evidence to reject it. So we do not reject the null hypothesis. And you could use the word except. And depending on whoever teaches you statistics when you get it, they may or may not have trouble with the word except.
But in, in that particular picture right there, there's not enough experimental evidence to suggest that the blue and the orange are from different populations, although we know that they are because we simulated it. Um, we can, ahead of time, specify a overlap probability at which we will make that decision. And typically it's 5%, although it will vary from case to case and application. And so we call that uh, selecting the um, level significance, or in this picture, if the overlap area, assuming we could calculate it, is 5% or greater, then we would not reject the null hypothesis. If the overlap area is less than 5%, we would reject it and in turn choose our alternative hypothesis. So that's what's meant by the level of significance. And you'll see that in your statistics books as alpha. Um, if we make the value, the overlap area probability small, that means things have to be pretty far apart to get a reject. If we make it big, almost any two things that are like in the same universe would be considered the same. Another thing is the p-value, or the calculated probability, uh, or attained significance. So the p-value is that area of overlap. Now, all we can normally do in practice is actually approximate a p-value, because we don't necessarily have the underlying population distribution. Um, if the p-value is bigger than alpha, we do not reject. We get to pick alpha, so we declare if overlap is 5%, we will, we will not reject. So we compute a p-value, we get 17% overlap. Is 17% bigger than 5? Yeah, even on a game show. And uh, so then we would not reject that null hypothesis. We do not have evidence that they're, diff that they're different. On the other hand, if the calculated p-value is, say, 4%, and our reject range is 5%, p-value is smaller than our predetermined alpha value that we choose as analysts. And in that case, we would reject the null hypothesis and declare that blue and orange are indeed different. Uh, here's some uh, other pictures taken from one of those uh, references. And... Um, I'll let you study that on your own. I, I find most of the pictures and statistics texts, even of my generation, um, incredibly confusing. I find blue and orange overlap makes complete sense, at least to me. And so you have to suffer with that at least for a couple more months. And then when we would get done with this testing regime, we haven't seen how to do the actual test yet, we would state something like the test determined that the data sample was normal, failing to reject the null hypothesis at a 5% significance level. Or we can rearrange that statement, test found that the data was normal, failing to reject the null hypothesis with a 95% confidence level. So significance level and confidence level are generally complements of each other. Um, you add them together, it adds up to 100%, is what that means. So let's, let's just look at a word example. Suppose you have a coin, and you don't know whether it's fair or tricky. Tricky being the kind of coin that the people on the strip in Las Vegas will hand you and then start to take your money from your pocket. Our null hypothesis is we have no reason from looking at it to be able to tell if it's fair or fake. So... We declare, okay, my null hypothesis is that it's a fair coin. My alternative hypothesis is it's not fair, it's tricky. Next, I want to uh, toss the coin a few times and determine the p-value associated with that. So if it's a fair coin and I toss it 1,000 times, how many heads should I get? About 500. How many tails? 
about 500. How many times should it land on edge? None. And so we, so we do that. Our first caw toss is a tail. Its p-value is 50% uh, because we've only done one toss. Uh, we do it again, and we get a tail again. Now the p-value is 25%. If we do it six times in a row, and we get a result of a p-value of 1.5%, but we set our significance level to 95, or our alpha reject level of 5%, um, we would probably reject the hypothesis that the coin is fair. If you get six tails in a row, that can happen by chance, but it's really unlikely. And we play that game for more than coins in our engineering world. If you want to learn more about p-values and you're still awake, you, see you have these three uh, URLs to visit. If you don't like reading, you can always watch YouTube. And here are some uh, good YouTube videos. So I've now formally introduced YouTube University. Uh, so the, the p-value is a probabilistic estimate. Again, in our picture of blue and orange, it represents the overlap area. And when we interpret the result of a test, we don't know what is true or false, only what's likely. So rejecting the null hypothesis means that there is evidence that there's, that there's um, not very much overlap. And so that null hypothesis is not likely for that population. We flip six tails in a row. There's evidence that there's something wrong with that coin. Um, but that doesn't mean that there is something wrong. It means it's just really, really likely, enough to bet your life on. So if you kind of keep that in mind, uh, that's, that's what statistical tests are. They're, they're trying to quantify what's likely based on the observations. Um, my favorite one is the likelihood of a great white shark swimming up a sewer pipe and biting you in the bum when you're in a toilet is really close to zero. And it's not a very likely thing. Statistical evidence worldwide says it is zero. There has never been an observed case of an adult great white shark swimming up a sewer pipe and biting someone in the bum. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. I wouldn't want to be near that sewer because probably when you flush it, it would suck everything in the room out, including you. And you'd be like an episode of Men in Black with turds. Um, <laughs> But, but that's all statistical tests are doing, is, is what's the uh, likelihood of that happening. Now, if you're on Mars, at the Mars habitat that doesn't exist yet, that likelihood goes to absolute zero, because they're not about to fly great white sharks up to uh, Mars. The last thing we need are sand sharks on another planet. <laughs> so the... Having a small p-value um, either means that the null hypothesis is wrong, we got it right, or there is some rare event that occurred in our sample um, that we made a mistake. And, and both those can happen. And those are called uh, type 1 and type 2 errors. So if the null hypothesis is true, excuse me, reality is the upper scale and the, what happens is here, if it turns out our null hypothesis is true, if there, and we conclude that it's true, we have just made an accurate statistics test. We're happy campers. The probability of that happening is 1 minus alpha, where alpha is our predetermined overlap um, percentage. If instead the null hypothesis is false and we conclude it's true from our test, we have a type 2 error, sad face. And the probability of that is, is beta. And outside the, that's outside this class to discuss how to specify beta. But beta is related to something called to a, related to something called the power of a test. If the null hypothesis is true and we conclude it's false, we have 
a type 1 error, sad face, and that occurs with probability alpha. So there is some incentive to keep alpha kind of small. So that's why the 5%, 6% uh, stuff is. By controlling alpha, we have some ability to influence type 1 error. And then if the alternative hypothesis is in fact true and we conclude it's true, we have an accurate test, we're happy. 1 minus beta probability. And so tests that have a lot of power can make that beta value sort of small so we can minimize the two kinds of errors. And I have a uh, somewhat, I think it's a funny picture. Um, so here are examples of those type 1 and type 2 errors in something that we can wrap our brains around. We have a doctor that's consulting a patient. In the upper left hand corner, the patient is a woman who's visibly pregnant. Um, She's got her unborn baby cradled comfortably, and the doctor comes in and says, yep, you're pregnant. And he probably ran an expensive array of tests to determine the obvious. That would be the, this, this thing right here, happy face. Next thing, the doctor goes to an old elderly gentleman, not unlike myself, and tells me I'm not pregnant. It's like, well, duh, I couldn't get pregnant if I wanted to. Um, oh, true negative, so we're down here. Also happy face. And now the type 1 and type 2 errors are indicated by the next two pictures. If the doctor comes to me and stares me in the face, looking at me, has an over 50-something gentleman reads his computer and says, you're pregnant, Mr. Cleveland. Um, I don't know, thank you very much. I'd like my copay back. I'm out of here. You're an idiot, right? But they don't show that part in the picture. Um, that is a false positive. That, that's a type 1 error. And that occurs down in this corner. So the null hypothesis is true. The alternative is actually true. We concluded the wrong thing. Type 1 error. Now the same doctor, this guy is about to lose his job when I'm done here, um, goes into the visibly pregnant woman, looks at his chart without looking at the patient. So I'm making a bad critique on medical care right now. And tells her, you're not pregnant. Um, that is a type 2 error. And that is when the alternative is actually true, and you conclude that the null is true. So we have the ability with our choice of alpha to have some impact on type 1 error. In your statistics class, you'll learn how to have some impact on type 2 error. In all evidence-based hypothesis testing, those errors exist. You can't make them go away. It's, it's impossible unless you do whole person sampling and you put the body in the vitamin or vitamin and grind it up and then pour it through a gas chromatograph. Go, yep, that was a human being. So now let's look at a, a few different types of tests. There's a whole bunch of them. And we actually access them either in the Skippy module or a statistics module. There's a, there's tests that, um, are aimed at trying to tell if our sample appears to have come from a normal distribution or not. And that's an important test to make because if it passes that test, then we get to use some parametric tests to make our further conjectures. If it doesn't, that's not the end of the day. It means we're kind of stuck with um, non-parametric tests, which are not as powerful. Our, our beta value is bigger in those. And just to some of them that you'll see, you'll see students t-test, paired t-test, analysis of variance, repeated uh, analysis of variance, Mann Whitney, Wilcox, Sign, Kruskal, Wallace, Friedman, and there's a, there's a ton more. These are just a few. Let's quickly look at them in the next five minutes or so. Um, so first one is Shapiro-Wilk. 
What this does is a, it's a test to determine whether a sample is Gaussian distributed or not. Gaussian is the same as normal. And it assumes that the observations in each sample are independent and identically distributed. So if there are serial correlations, uh, that will impact things. And the null hypothesis is the sample is normal. The alternative is it's not. So here's some data uh, pulled out of my datum. And so it's, it's a list of like nine or ten things. And in the Skippy stats package, there is a function called Shapiro. And what we can do is we'll run the function. We'll take the output. We'll put the value of the, of the Shapiro statistic, which is just some kind of number, and then the, uh, the p-value. We'll specify our alpha, and if the overlap region is bigger than our alpha, we will declare it Gaussian, and if it's smaller than our alpha, not Gaussian. So again, we're looking at the blue and orange overlap. We do that, sure enough, it's probably Gaussian. And I wonder what used to be there. It's gone now. A second uh, test is called De Agostino's K squared test. That's kind of fun to say. Um, its purpose is to do the same thing. Um, it's useful when you have multiple data sets. So in this case, we'll have data and data two. And we will look at the data2 set. And we get the same conclusion in this case. The p-value is there's 46% overlap. So if our alpha is 5%, there is no evidence to reject an null hypothesis. This is very strongly um, Gaussian. And then you'll notice the red rectangle of encouragement it's just telling me that uh, the sample size is too small, but I'm going to I'm going to continue anyway. But don't use this when money's involved. That's what it's telling us. It doesn't say that in those words. You can read more on normality tests um, at this uh, reading spot. So once we've determined our sample data appears to be normally distributed, that doesn't mean it came from a normal distribution. It's just the data itself appears to be normally distributed. That allows us to use a whole collection of parametric tests. So first one is student's t-test and in that we can um, compare two different samples. In this case we're going to compare data and data 2 and we're going to operate on the null hypothesis that the means of the samples are the same versus the alternative, the means of the samples are different. This is a two-tailed test. So if you see the cat running down the street with two tails, it's probably Schrodinger's cat, and um, it's doing a hypothesis test. So there is the, the mean value of data 1 is 0.32, the mean value of data 2 is 0.15. So just the calculation, those are different numbers. And what the test will do is tell us are they different because the two distributions are far enough apart, or are they just diff different by consequence? Is the, is the blue and the orange overlapping? And we run the test. So, so this part of the test, that's code that I provided, or that you would provide. So we're testing if the computed probability is bigger than the alpha value. If that's true, then you use the null hypothesis. If it's not true, use the alternative. So in this case, this tells us it's probably the same distribution, or you can conclude that the means are probably the same. Um, we can take a different data too. So all I did is going to use different values. And if we look at the uh, different values, um, Did it actually do the difference? And I get a test statistic of minus 
0.23, which is the difference in the two means. And then we could actually perform a parametric test on that. Another type of testing is done on something called paired data. So when there is a one-to-one -one pairing in the data, so let's suppose data one represents an upstream measurement of something and data two represents a downstream measurement of the same thing at slightly different locations in space. So the pairing is upstream versus downstream. But each measurement pair corresponds to probably the same moment in time. Um, pairing is a powerful additional tool, and so we can use the paired students t-test uh, to compare the two. So if we look at this data one, we have a 0.87 and a 1.14 and, and so on. And what pairing is, is testing is, it, is there evidence that something changed between one side of the pair and the other? And it has to be something changed for all elements of the pairing. So you can't have one high, one low, and the next one low and high and have that make sense. That, that would return the uh, interpretation that the pairing is irrelevant. So again, we use the t-test, REL, and run it. And in this case, these two data uh, with pairing, there's no evidence that there's any influence of the pairing on the data. So again, blue and orange are overlapping. I'll skip the analysis of variance. The man Whitney, I want to do uh, at least one um, non-parametric test. If you can't, if we don't pass the normality test, it doesn't mean we can throw up our hands and go home and say, oh, I can't be tested, I'm out of here. It'd be nice, but that's not how it works. We have a whole category of things that are called non-parametric, and they don't care whether the uh, sample appears to be normal or not. They do care that the sample appears to be independent and identically distributed. They require that the sample can be ranked from small to big or big to small, and um, the observations within the sample are paired, and from that, um, those three assumptions, we, we have the null hypothesis is that the distributions of both samples are equal versus they're not equal. So the, so the test itself is easy to use. It's called Wilcoxon. You put in one series and the other series. The series are supposed to be the same length. If they have different lengths, you've broken the pairing relationship. And all it's going to do is essentially systematically test is data 2 bigger than its pair in data 1, yes or no. It'll keep doing that through all pairs. If the number of yeses is about the same as the number of noes, then we conclude that those two samples are of similar distributional information. And so we do that. Our p-value in this case was 50 percent, and if our reject was 5%, we would conclude that there's no evidence that there's much difference in these two. Um, there's a couple more, and uh, we'll get to this. Oh, actually, you're gonna, I think you do this for... I'll get to this next class meeting. So we will revisit this um, actual lesson, because I have a practical, a practical um, example. Thank you for your attention and for telling me your body weights and all you invisible people out there in radio land. We know that your body weight is most likely somewhere between 159 and 219 pounds. And anybody outside that range, if you let me know, we will deduct something on Blackboard. I'm just kidding on that. Have a good day. I'll see you in uh, 15 minutes.